So I looked through the literature, I looked at what was known about M10, and I thought it would make a really interesting uh, example of how we talk about how objects orbit other objects. So all the stars in M10 are orbiting around the center of mass, and, and they're, they're mostly gravitationally bound. But M10 itself is orbiting around our galaxy. So just like our solar system, the Earth is orbiting around the Sun, but the Sun is then orbiting around the center of our galaxy in the disk of the galaxy. And that's the slight difference with M10. Uh, the globular clusters are mostly located outside the disk. Uh, so if you think of the, the galaxy as kind of a fried egg of a, a disk of, of stars and gas and dust with a bulge in the middle, the, the globular clusters are, are located mostly out in the halo where all the dark matter is. But what's interesting is the same physics governs everything, everywhere. And so if you think about the orbit of the, the planets around the Sun, uh, we can actually describe those orbits in six numbers, which I find kind of interesting. It really comes down to following mostly Kepler's laws, laws of physics that have been known for hundreds of years. Uh, and reducing those motions to a few numbers. Kepler's first law with respect to the solar system is that planets orbit the Sun in an elliptical path with the Sun at one focus. So that's most, most undergraduate physics students would hopefully be able to tell you that. Um, so what that means is, if this is your orbit here, the first number that you have is the eccentricity. And that says how much, how different that orbit is from an ellipse. So in this case, we can stretch it out and make it very elliptical or sort of elliptical. The next thing you can do is measure some, have some sort of measure of the size of the orbit. We measure that by the semi-major axis, the length of the longest part of the ellipse. So you can imagine I could stretch this out if I could keep it as an ellipse. You'd have a bigger orbit or a smaller orbit. So that's two. The third number that you can have is the inclination. So if you imagine some reference plane, like for example this table, you could incline that orbit through any number of angles. Number four is probably my favorite because it's called the longitude of the ascending node, which is a great name. As whatever object is going around this elliptical orbit, at some point it's going to come up through the plane of that reference plane. Okay, and so that we just, you know, that's an arbitrary point to pick, but you, you say what angle does that make going round like this, and that fixes it in that dimension. And then the fifth is the argument of periastris. These are great names. And that just means, again, you pick up a, a fixed reference point, and periapsis means the closest point to the, the center of the orbit. So, uh, you know, if, if you think of the solar system, that would be perihelion, closest to the sun. If it's around a star, it would be periastron. Around the galaxy, it's perigalacticon. Um, but the general name is periapsis. And so what that means is that you can then rotate in that plane and fix the orientation of the orbit that way. And that gives all of your spatial orientations, makes them all fixed. And the sixth one adds the element of time. And that just says, at a given time, uh, you just need to, f to, to say at one point in time where the object is in that orbit. And then that fixes the entirety of that elliptical orbit. Gives you like a start point to work forward or back from. Exactly. You just specify your, your time, where it is at that point, and, and you're done. But, and, and this is where M10 comes in, is that sometimes those orbits don't stay fixed. So there's lots of ways you could perturb an orbit and make it change a bit. So that fifth element that I mentioned, the argument of periapsis, that can change. And we have a very famous example of that, which is the perihelion, the precession of the perihelion of Mer Mercury. We could, for a long time, trace Mercury's orbit very well, um, but even accounting for all of the other perturbations of all the other planets, etc., there was still one unexplained movement in that orbit, change in that orbit over time that couldn't be explained. And that ended up being uh, one of the first proofs of general relativity. Going back to M10, I'm talking about the solar system, but M10, this globular cluster, orbits the galaxy in a slightly inclined orbit. It occasionally plunges down through the disk and passes up through the other side. When it does that plunge through the disk, mm -hmm. is that a hazardous time or is the disk so empty in itself that it can just happily wander through without smashing into anything? Well, it's not going to smash into anything. Space is extraordinarily empty 
but uh, it does not come unscathed. And that's, that's actually the route that I took into finding the information about this because I found this paper which is called The Effect of Tidal Shocks on the Evolution of Globular Clusters. In this paper, they ask exactly that question. How dangerous is it for a globular cluster to pass repeatedly through the plane of the galaxy? Uh, and it turns out it, it is pretty dangerous, um, but not through direct collisions, through tidal effects. Um, and, and that means the gravitational stripping of stars in the outskirts of the globular cluster as it passes through the plane of the disk. Well, first of all, I was quite astonished to realize that you, we could actually model the orbits of globular clusters. The example they use in this paper is M10, and they actually provide a model for the orbit. Why are you astonished by that? I would have thought it was obvious. We can, we can model all sorts. So we can model galaxies and all sorts? We can, but anything involving time we haven't been along very, around very long to make observations and things on the sky, most of them don't move very fast. This globular cluster, it takes 150 million years to complete one orbit. So it actually turns out that you know, those measurements are made using photographic plates that go back 80 or 100 years. That's the time scale that you need. But even then, that has to be tied to a very accurate reference frame because you, you, you can't, you know, everything, everything is moving a little bit. Uh, so you, you, need to, you need to have a very well established reference frame. You get some really neat patterns in the orbit. So I mentioned that, you know, orbits of things often proceed in a very you know, fixed elliptical fashion. But sometimes, as I mentioned, that ellipse can get perturbed. And so what you're seeing here is the position over time of M10 presented in a funny way. So on this axis, you have radius from the center of the galaxy. So that's how far it is from the center. And so it's going in and out, you know, it's, it's changing its, its position with respect to the center of the galaxy, how far away it is. Z represents the distance above and below the disk. So sometimes it's up here, and then it passes through and it goes down on the other side. And so both of these motions are happening um, at the same time. But if it was just on a little ellipse, it would follow the same pattern over and over again. And clearly it's not. Uh, something is, is perturbing it uh, and, and making it change. And if we think back to our orbital elements, that means that the argument of the periapsis is changing. And I can demonstrate that really easily with this fun toy from everyone's childhood, because... I don't know what that is. You don't know what that is? I don't have one of them. Right, okay. You did not have a spirograph. No, I didn't. That's, but... that's crazy. If you set this up, you can produce an orbit that looks like an ellipse, right? But it's actually not quite, doesn't quite come back to the same point. And if we follow that through time, that changes and makes a pattern. And in this case, this is exactly what's happening to M10. So its ellipse is shifting by a little bit every time, and it obeys what's called a Rosette Nebula. 